Why doesn't anybody ever talk about this movie? This movie is very significant for both black and white cinema and nobody ever talks about it. Ugh, we gonna talk about it today. guys welcome back to my channel it's tyra here with another struggle review here to discuss coolie high now this movie is from 1975 and it stars glenn truman and lawrence hilton jacobs now before we get into all things preach and coaches i need you guys to drop down and subscribe to my channel and like this video i'm going to give you guys a moment to do that and then we're going to come back and discuss if there is ever a movie that i can rely on to give me a little waterworks it's this one right here. I don't care how many times I go back and watch this movie. It's like, you know, uh, is that it? Is that water? It's water every single time. Y'all didn't have to kill him. It did not have to go down like that. It hurts every time. Go back, 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 back. guys have hopefully subscribed to see more of me let's get into this movie but before we jump into the video i have to give a shout out to the person who paid for it and requested this movie so if you happen to pour out a little liquor for the brothers who ain't here it's not because of me it's because of this person right here thank you so much for supporting me and paying for this content now getting into this movie this movie was directed by michael schultz why is nobody ever discussing this man and giving him some type of flowers? This man has been directing theater, film, television work for many, many years now, and the filmography is thick. Not only do we have the likes of Cooley High, but we have movies like Car Wash, Which Way Is Up, Bust and Loose, The Last Dragon, Disorderlies, Living Large, Crush Groove, and that's not even getting into him still directing things today like All American and Black Lightning. I never hear this man mentioned in the conversation when he has clearly made a lane for himself all while inspiring a whole lot of other black directors that came after him and at the same time giving us classic movies that we still hold near and dear to our hearts today. I don't care where you find him, give the man some flowers. And the same can be said for the writer Eric Monty. He modeled Preach after himself. This is kind of his life story growing up in Chicago, uh, the Cabrini Green, losing a childhood friend, wanting to be a writer, even going to Cooley High School. But he also wanted to show that even though you grew up in projects, even though you didn't have a lot of financial means, it was still a good time. You still enjoyed your time with your friends. You still, you know, managed to grow up well. And everybody still had their own individual visual aspirations for what they wanted to be. And not only did Preaches, aka Eric Monty's goals come true of him wanting to be a writer, writing Cooley High, writing for shows like The Jeffersons, and being the whole driven and writing creative force behind shows like What's Happening, Good Times, Sadly, ending off on a bad note, he was not credited or really compensated for these things. A lot of the creative process, the writing for these shows like What's Happening in Good Times were all credited to Norman Lear. Cooley High was a really, really epic movie for the time. This was 1975. This was that big boom of the black exploitation era. Most, if not all of these movies were written and created by white men and told from their perspective, you know, jive turkey sucker, sticking it to the man, you know, we getting all these drugs out the community. Yeah, get in there, bitch. You know, all of those good <laughs> exploitative ass films. But then this movie comes along and it's not only directed by a black person, but it is written from a black perspective. And this is the first time that you see black people, especially teenagers, and this type of element that shows, oh, we can write characters with depth 
we can, you know, talk about other subject matter and people will still come out and watch these movies. The story was really grounded, really realistic, and we've seen this formula repeated so many times. I think the movie Juice is most infamous for taking this story and flipping it and using it in their own way. We see that with the friendship, with the deaths, multiple scenarios. Like watching Cooley High was almost like watching Juice without Bishop running around being trigger happy 24 seven, but those friendship dynamics are there. You know, skipping class, smoking a little weed, no direction, nobody believing in Q as a DJ, AKA preach as that writer. The ranking within the friendship group still kind of being pulled or getting picked on, getting talked about, losing your best friend who's, you know, murdered, who was that mediator, the calm one, the cool one, very much so cold cheese. It's all there. Even when we travel on over across the pond and get into movies like Boys in the Hood, that whole dynamic of the friendship group, the whole Ricky, that Ricky death hits just as hard as cold cheese getting murdered here in all of, you know, John Singleton, Eric Dickerson, all of these people were very much so influenced by Eric Monty and Michael Schultz and Cooley High. It is really beautiful the way that this movie decided to trickle down and it's just such a part of pop culture. Even when we get into the music side and we get into, you know, shit like Camp Low, this is it, what? Lucini pouring from the sky, let's get rich, what? Hey, sipping on my red dove. <laughs> Oh, we go to the early, you know, 2000. You don't know my name. I do look a lot different outside my work clothes, you know. My mama said, can't nobody sit on the break front. It is all up and through and it is a gorgeous thing. Now we can't even discuss the movie without discussing the soundtrack first. With this movie being set in 1964, all the music being backed by Motown 60s artists, we get into Martha Reeves and the Vandellas, Diana Ross and the Supremes, Junior Walker and the All Stars. Everybody is here as soon as the movie comes on and we hit that ooh, uh, ooh baby love, my baby love, I need ya, uh -huh, I need ya. I'm sorry, Florence should have been in the front. <laughs> Florence should have been in the front. If y'all weren't too busy telling her layoff ethic, just take the money and run, she should have been in the front. What, what, you know, that's not here or there. You get this overwhelming sensation of this wholesome teenage era. Not that a lot of the shit going on here in this movie is wholesome, but there's this, you know, carefree innocence when you get into this throwback 60s soul music, all these great voices. And as soon as they skip class and you hear, everybody say yeah. Like, come on, Stevie. <laughs> Say yeah. Say yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ow. Oh, play the harmonica. <laughs> this movie is such a good time. And my number is Beachwood 45789. You can call me up at any day at any old time. They don't even say shit like that no more. It's my number in the dime. Call me anytime. Now we are introduced to Preach and Cochise, two teenage black best friends who can't seem to think of anything better to do than think of elaborate ways to skip school and think of even more elaborate ways to get some girls. They hang out with their other two friends, Pooter and Willie, crack your mama jokes, smoke weed, run amok, and always make time to shoot dice and hang out at the local black spot Martha's. Now re-watching this, what I really enjoyed the most was how genuine and realistic our characters feel. These really feel like teenagers from Cabrini Green. Even though a lot of the actors here were not actors at all and they were just found in your local projects, it adds such a sense of normalcy to what we are watching. When you watch a lot of movies with teenage portrayals, especially black teenagers, especially black teenagers in the hood, it's always one note as far as how these teenagers may conduct themselves. They're always going above and beyond to depict them as anything but teenagers. Here, you feel like you know them. It feels so natural and it helps a whole lot that this movie is led by Glenn Truman and Lawrence Hilton Jacobs. They did such a good job carrying this movie on their backs. Not that anybody was, you know, subpar actors or not, but they were so awesome. 
any other time in any other movie with the caliber of which they executed their characters especially glenn truman i feel like he did such an awesome job here it would be remembered it would be praised but the performances here really quite go unnoticed nobody really from this film went on to be a big star we do know of course uh glenn truman's career and what he has been able to do he's still execute executing uh great roles now like my Rainey's black bottom all the way to you know him being colonel taylor Lawrence Hilton Jacobs to not really go on you know of course we know Michael Marlon who left the title in the swimming pool everybody knows that <laughs> but I don't feel like they went on to just have really awesome careers that they could have had even for the time like they should have been in more things like the performance here was really good Dorothy all I know is that your mama's a hoe oh come on Dorothy you know your mama like the dog <laughs> I bet you don't get none from that high yellow bitch I bet you a dollar I get some. Like, let's get into cold cheese and preach being little assholes. <laughs> the fact that I was living for them being depicted as natural teenage boys, just being little assholes, running around trying to get some. The way that movies go today, the way that they have to handle characters and be politically correct and, oh, we can't portray or do certain things, like have young men out here, like, really aggressively trying to press girls to get some. This is what niggas be doing, like... <laughs> These are natural progressions of, you know, no, learning that no means no, always having, you know, an arterial motive, willing to bet, you know, that you could get some from a female. Like, these are growth spurs. I, li I like miss these natural, real depictions instead of, you know, the politically correct things that we tend to get now. The way that characters are portrayed now, there is no room for error, no room for growth, no room to do anything without just being completely penalized for it and being, you know, called an apist. Like, it's, it's just so much, like, I just miss the natural progressions of, you know, getting more into your adulthood or your womanhood. Knowing that it's natural for every single guy that you meet to not have the best intentions, to might, you know, just want to hit it and quit it. Like, these are natural progressions of life. And watching the shit that we get into today, you probably wouldn't know that. I find this to be the most true when we get into our two main characters and the way that they are portrayed. Cold cheeses popular <laughs> he is very braggadocious he is kind in his own way he has all the ladies he is soon to be you know college bound with his basketball scholarship to grambling university he has a future he's looking forward to it he's not you know the best academically but he is a really consistent great friend to preach He's a leader. He's strong, ambitious, suave. The girls were literally throwing it at him in this movie. Like, you know how suave you gotta be to get some standing upright in a hallway? The fuck? <laughs> he was dodging it left and right. The person who wishes that they could have had an ounce of that was Preach. Like, Preach's character here needs to be discussed and looked into a whole lot more because I saw him reflected in myself and just so many avenues that I have seen throughout my adult life. Aspiring to be a ladies man like Cochise, maybe even fall in with local hoodlums like Robert and Stone, already head down the wrong path, shooting dice, having broken teeth at such a young age. He wants to be everything but himself. Preach, in my opinion, was the most realistic portrayal of a teenager. Then and now, we are pretty much at the end of our high school years. We're going up. It's time to, you know, start making decisions about what we want to do with our life. He has no clue what he wants to do and what he wants to be academically. He has no interest in school, even though he is probably the smartest person in the room. He's well versed as far as literature and reading, but he has absolutely no interest in school. And he has chosen already for himself what he believes that he will excel at and be great at, which is being a writer. Preach constantly lies. <laughs> he's always making up stories as far as who he's been with, what he's done with his life, where he's been, and it's all to deflect. All of the wisecracking, all of the yo mama jokes, all of the elaborate schemes just to skip class, all to deflect from who he really is. Preach is quite brilliant and could be really, really successful in whatever field that he probably chose to go into. The problem is the one thing that he truly excels at and he's good at, 
he is ranked on and ridiculed for it by every single person except for Cochise. Well, I don't know, Preach. Why don't you hit him with your throbbing manhood? <laughs> you this movie is funny like I think thinking of Cooley High you always think of you know the ending but before we get to the ending this movie is really light and really funny and really just you know so much fun. Preach is a whole savant when it comes to writing his poetry the way that he chooses to express himself not only you know in his writing but you know the way that he uses literature to express himself to Brenda later on he is so skilled and has a lot of depth to himself as a writer even at that young age but nobody sees the value in what he could be because you're not trying to be an entertainer you're not trying to be a basketball player like Cochise this is stupid you could never be that people are so in a rush to make fun of him and tell him what he could never be that he is kind of starting to believe the hype Preach very much so understands that his dream is a big one. And though we could have been in school trying to do something to help us excel even more as far as a writer, we have chosen to stop our success before it even starts. I don't think he would have left to go and be a writer if the situation hadn't happened to Cochise. He was too busy about to just get pulled down into all the other elements that the neighborhood had to offer. Though I take a lot of pride in my writing, I would rather shoot dice, skip school, smoke a little weed, do everything but succeed because everybody around me is telling me that I won't. Me wanting to be a writer isn't uplifted and praised in the same breath like Cochise who wants to be a basketball star. But what I can do is attach myself to Cochise. He's my best friend. I can aspire to want to be a ladies man like him, want to get some all the time like him, want to be as popular and tough as him. I'm not that. But what I can do is maybe get something that Cochise doesn't have that nobody's had this entire movie. I could try to get my hands on light skin, yellow bone Brenda, cause she's a commodity that'll make me somebody. I always thought Preach felt really small in comparison to Cochise, even though they were best friends. There was, you know, a hint of jealousy there because not only was, you know, Cochise, Cochise, but he had a plan already. He had a goal that he had reached. He was well on his way to go to school and be what he wanted to become. Well, we have Preach on the other hand, he is just absolutely lost. And I felt like he was scared of what was to come. You know, my friend here goes away and goes to college, high school is over. And then exactly what am I left with? Because he is spending so much time in this movie, really beginning to self-sabotage himself. If the situation had not happened with Cochise, I really do feel like Preach would have just been, you know, a lost call and just wrote off as just wasted potential of some Somebody who was really promising and really smart in the neighborhood but went on to just not be anybody. Now we have the movie really pick up once Cochise is accepted into Grambling University with his basketball scholarship. You know we pour some out for the brothers in jail and the brothers who ain't here. I was like oh you about to be the brothers who ain't here. We gonna pour some out for you. No. <laughs> but once we get into Dorothy in her quarter party like Dorothy is an unsung hero of the movie to me. I love Dorothy. I love the performance from the actress. I love the cadence in her voice. It's really natural. My mama said, don't nobody supposed to sit on the break front. My mama said, don't nobody supposed to turn the lights off. You ain't getting in unless you got a quarter. Oh, hey, sweet mama, where you been? Oh, don't give me that shit, Tyrone. You had my phone number and you ain't even called. <laughs> Between Tyrone and Dorothy, goddamn Cochise and every single female that rolled up on him, preaching Brenda, panties was dropping a little too easy in 64. The only person who had some sense was goddamn Sandra. I ain't giving you nothing. That's right, nigga, get off me. <laughs> She saw Preach exactly for what he was. I'm not giving you nothing. Back up off me. Which, you know, begs the question of the decision that she made later on in the movie. But Sandra was not going for anything that Preach was giving out. But the quarter party is a really good time. Like, when we get into these older movies that depict, you know, the 50s and the 60s and the vibes of, you know, the red light or the blue light, everybody dancing, fully clothed, you know, grinding them sweaters and turtlenecks together, <laughs> them pencil skirts. Hello, my name is Richard Morrison, and by the time I get up, I need your name, 
your address and your phone number. Like, sir, sir, <laughs> trying to be all smooth and outside. But the goodness of just slow dancing in the dark, all of the ooh, baby, baby, all the good Smokey Robinson. I even like this movie taking a moment to sprinkle in a little colorism when we get into the situation with Preach and Brenda. Preach knows absolutely nothing about Brenda except for how she looks. She was not in the business of giving anything up just as much as Sandra was, but Sandra was actually his girlfriend here. It is very much so understated because we barely see her, but he is in the movie supposedly ducking and dodging Sandra all while trying to get on Brenda, all while trying to win this bet for this dollar. But he only saw value in her because she was lighter skinned. She was high yellow. She was a hot commodity around the neighborhood. And then they go out of their way in this movie to depict Brenda. Brenda was a fucking psycho. Who the fuck comes to a quarter party and reads a book in the, ba in the bedroom? Who? Murderers, that's who. But Brenda does everything except for maybe spit and preach his face, but he keeps on persisting. But he saw no value in anything that he had with Sandra. Other than that, the quarter party is a good time. We do have him eventually start to win Brenda over. Girl, I thought you were smarter. <laughs> because she is maybe one of the few that he is choosing to be his genuine self with, you know, read his poetry, show a different side to himself. And she's like, oh, you different. He wasn't girl, you should kept your clothes on. <laughs> Now all hell breaks loose at the quarter party once Damien arrives and sees Cochise slow winding all up on his old lady and of course this spills over into the vendetta that he has against him in the movie to where he does what he does to him at the end of the film. But that does not make it any less hilarious. Goddamn Dorothy, ain't gonna be no fighting up in here. If y'all wanna fight, y'all better take it outside. Pooter, get up and get off the break front. It ain't paid for yet. If any fighting goes down up in here, this my last party. No, Tyrone, please, Tyrone, don't fight. You better get off of me. Who you pushing? What? Like... <laughs> Dorothy punching Tyrone is fucking hilarious. Just as much as, you know, I got these good clean girls, you know, this good girl named Lucia, but you know, the bitch is a thief. So you might as well, you know, leave all your personals, all your valuables in this envelope. I'll hold them for you until you come back down. Oh uh, yeah, I I'm, I'm looking for Lucia. What the hell you want here, honk it? Like, <laughs> between that and shit like, I do so much thinking of you. Oh, y'all gonna leave Puda alone. Y'all gonna leave Puda alone. If any of the girls had any sense, they would have been trying to push up on Puda. Puda was polite. <laughs> he was respectful. Puda was cute. And he always had a cute piece of corn, probably with a fetch. Y'all was going after the wrong ones. But I absolutely love the strong elements of comedy in this movie. You know, get on the ground, lay down, stupid, lay down. Whiplash, whiplash, oh Lord, whiplash, I'm hurt. <laughs> or goddamn, get up against the wall, bitch. Hey, what you looking for? I didn't find it. Hey, y'all don't look like no cops to me. That's why they hired us, baby, because we don't look like cops. Old dusty ass priest trying to cop a field. I love how we can seemingly go from really innocent situations that mean nothing, like going to the movies to see Godzilla and all of a sudden being gang gang because Puda don't know when to sit down. How many boxes of popcorn did you need? Puda, sit your ass down. <laughs> Causing a whole fight, that whole scene was absolutely hilarious. But we can have good old fashioned good times like that where we're eating popcorn, watching Godzilla cop in the field, or we can be in the wrong place at the wrong time, like behind the wheel preach line as he was driving for this, you know, old ring. You weren't driving for a motherfucking person because if you were, we would not be on this goddamn high speed ass chase away from the police. I love the fact that Glenn Truman, due to the budget, he was actually driving that car, which is absolutely insane because wow. Though this is supposed to be an innocent joyride and they get away, this changes the course of their lives forever. But you know, not before Preach gets some. Like, Brenda, why? You could have had anybody. <laughs> you could have had anybody, Brenda. But I do love the realistic aspects of that. How many of us can look back on losing our virginity and be like, you know, I'm really glad I gave it to that person. We never are. <laughs> We never are, you know, they try to persuade us. I guess 
you say what can make me feel this way this ain't your girl you can't persuade us with a long walk Brenda should not have been there but she ended up anyway trusting him giving his little bird chest awkward line as her whole virginity i love how he has those second thoughts where she's like undressing and he looks off like "Ooh, this isn't right i should you know be honest with her but you know i'm still gonna get my lights and you know i'm still gonna get some girl come on oh absolutely not <laughs> It's not until after the fact that he decides to mention that, you know, there was a bed and I haven't been 100% honest. You know, I thought you were different. I really thought you meant it. I thought you cared about me, girl. Don't we all? <laughs> but then again, what kind of situation was Brenda on? She made it her business. You know, that's for yesterday, bastard. Like, what were you kissing on him in front of Sandra for? So you knew about Sandra and you moved forward with it anyway? Oh, high school was scandalous. <laughs> I love how Sandra Sandra walks up like, what's going on here? What is this? Like, girl, where you been? Where you been? I needed her to be in the movie a whole lot more with the weight that she was supposed to hold, especially when we have that be the catalyst for Priest to be upset with Coach Cheese because he eventually sleeps with her. Like, oh, girl, you want nothing to do with preaching his bird chest, but you was all over Coach Cheese. You didn't even know him. <laughs> But he gets mad, like, you know, I can't ever have anything. Like, her too, you have all the women. You had to have that. Like, you ain't give a damn about Sandra. That's why you ran your little happy ass around the corner to Martha and ended up in Brenda's face like nothing ever happened. Stop. Now, Mr. Mason, a.k.a. Stanley, a.k.a. Garrick Morrison, a.k.a. Uncle Junior, I needed him to be in this movie more. There isn't a strong presence of parents. We do, of course, have, you know, a little bit of Cochise's family. And we do see Preach's mother, but she is constantly off to work, as you would be, you know, in the projects as a single mom. But the way that Garrett Morrison had, the way that he acted as a teacher, we do hear about him within the movie about, you know, moving tests around, constantly really, you know, hounding them, especially Preach to be a little bit more dedicated to their education maybe graduating maybe becoming somebody i just love his whole energy like take them goddamn shades off you don't scare me nigga i knock you out like i like that we need more teachers like that <laughs> But we really have him come through for Preach and Cochise once shit gets real. And the police try to come and pick them up for stealing the car, for joyriding. And he saves their ass because he sees them as good kids. Unlike Stone and Robert, who I guess were just lost causes, honey. I don't even think they went to school. Winding up going to jail, well, I guess a little holding cell, honey. Because they were out rather quickly. So I don't know what was going on with that. But word around the school because nobody else knows what happened or how they got out so quickly and didn't do any jail time now they are marked as snitches i love the cameo that we get from a very young robert townsend in his first little movie role i was like look at him <laughs> But I absolutely adore the really brief conversation that Preach has with Mr. Mason in the bathroom. And it's just like, don't you want something out of your life, son? Don't you want to go on to be somebody? You could be brilliant. You could be so many things. You are one of the few kids who could probably not show up for class, not do any studying, but bring your ass in here and pass. You are intentionally doing this to yourself. What do you want? Uh, you know, I want to live forever. He is so lost. <laughs> He is so lost and so afraid, trying to avoid the inevitable. Eventually, you have to graduate. You have to leave high school, whether you're as graduate or you just age out, honey. And you have to make decisions for your life. But he is feeling stuck because nobody, except for maybe Coach Cheese, has praised him and lifted him up, told him that he could go on. You could be a great writer. We believe in you. How about you apply yourself and try to get your own damn scholarships? But for many people, even those things don't matter. Sometimes if you just don't believe in yourself or don't see it for yourself, then you just don't give an effort to even try and you do get stuck. But before we get to, you know, the inevitable and we get into that really sad ending, we do have more comedy. Once he is informed that, you know, nobody snitched and it was Mr. Mason and he tries to inform Cochise, of course, eventually leading us to the wild goose chase of them trying to find each other, all while Preach is trying to avoid Robert and Stone. Like, it is so funny. I do love the scene in the bathroom where, you know, well, turn around then. <laughs> Girl, ain't nobody trying to look at you. You's a sissy and your mama's a sissy too. Get out, get out. Don't open that door. I don't want nobody to see me like this. I don't want nobody to see me like this. Well, girl, pull your pants up. Ain't nobody looking at you. Well, turn around then and say, oh, nice. Like, that 
boyish, you know, little perv ass energy. <laughs> That, uh, that little charm that preach gives off, just this innocence of not knowing how severe and how serious the situation is. It just call, calls back to how young and innocent they are. Here, you know, he is thinking that this is a cat and mouse situation. This is just another instance of me running away from a bully. Another moment of Martha coming over with her meat cleaver to run us out of the diner. This is every day for us. This is, you know, no bigger than a dice game. Meanwhile, you are about to lose your best friend. Martha, open the back door, please. Please, Martha, please. Martha was over it. Preach definitely did not think that this was a super serious situation. Yes, I just had an argument with my best friend behind the girl, but so what? I'm mad now, but I can always make up with him later. But a lot of times people do not get a later and he loses his friend. We do have them just about missing each other in search for each other, especially Coach East just wanting to apologize to his friend because his friendship means so much to him. And unfortunately, Coach East is found by Robert and Damien in search for his ass like oh even though it could have been inevitable they were in search for the both of them but it, it just hits harder because coaches was out there looking intentionally for preach when he eventually finds coaches of course it's too late that whole fight sequence always floored me because i always run it back like five times to see exactly what coaches hit you know it was kind of a fatal blow to the face if they would have stayed maybe you know call the ambulance maybe you know he he could have been saved but they literally run off leaving priest to find his body like it is so sad and heartbreaking when he eventually finds him and he just drops to his knees and help help but the sound of the subway cart and the trash it is just overpowering his screams for help and it's like damn when did we get here he is just full-blown dead and there is such a shift in the movie and it's so sad because you have grown with them you enjoy their friendship despite everything or even the you know the little fight you know how much they mean to each other and how much he means like these are best friends and now i've lost him and now you know maybe a little bit you know feeling a little guilty like he was out here looking for me i didn't reach him in time i wasn't here for him when he needed me and then we get into the funeral like oh lord the fact that you know he couldn't be there he didn't want to speak to him amongst you know their friends amongst other people and you know they chime in with the it's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday wow like oh god <laughs> And I'll take with me the memories to be my sunshine after the rain. It's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. Like, bruh, don't, don't be trying to have me emotional with this movie. That song and this scene is so tied together with what happened to Cochise. Whenever you hear it's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday, it's a sad occasion. You think about this death, it is just so sad. But I do love that he does go to say goodbye to his friend in his own way. You know, the whole swish, of course, some out for the homies who ain't here. Like, oh, it is so emotional. Him finally being vulnerable and trusting enough with somebody to read his own actual stuff and, you know, reads and, you know, it don't even rhyme. Like, oh, it's. It is so sad, like, and of course this ties in with uh, Eric Monty once again. This did actually happen with him losing a childhood friend. Now he did run away. He dropped out, <clears throat> which I guess we could say that. I mean, like, did, did he graduate? Uh, <laughs> Eric Monty did uh, decide to drop out of school and go straight to the army. And when he got out of the army, he went to Hollywood to become a writer, but he did drop out of school. I like to think that he did, Preach did also here in this movie, but it is just so sad. It's such a sad ending to such a really lighthearted, funny film. Like all these emotions y'all are sending me through, like it's messing me up. And then they decide to lift them up instantly with some four tops. Hey, now if you feel that you can't go on, hey, and that all of your hope is gone, out, oh, and your life is filled with such confusion, uh, until happiness is just an illusion, uh, and the world around you keeps crumbling down, oh, darling, reach out, uh, come on, girl. Reach out for me, reach out, reach out for me. See, that's when they fuck you up and they hit you with that. <laughs> with the love that will 
Michelle to get the four tops was fucking it up in the end. I never understood why Damien, like, how y'all get to go on? I don't care if they were, you know, killed in the whole gas station robbery. Damien, the whole person who killed it, Cochise, went on to become a U.S. sergeant? Why? Why? He should have been in prison. <laughs> but we do get to see how everybody ended up with the most success being, you know, afforded to Preach, who went on to be a successful Hollywood screenwriter. I mean, like, I guess, I guess we should, you know, celebrate his success. Oh, man. <laughs> But I guess we do have a very reasonable, natural ending to what was a good movie that ended so tragically. Coolie High will always be a cool, good ass time to go back and watch any time of day, any year, no matter how old you are. Well, you guys, that was my review for Coolie High. I hope you enjoyed it. Please drop down and tell me what this movie means to you. Get in those comments. Tell me your favorite scenes, your favorite lines from the movie, what you take away from it. Do you look at it any differently now that you're older? Like, were you a preach? Were you a coachies? Drop down in the comments and tell me that. I look forward to reading them. Thank you guys so much for supporting my channel and watching this video. I'll see y'all next time. Bye.